Americas, Africa, or Europe, I'd like to welcome you to the third day in the thematic session on extreme weather. Um, as a little background, coastal hazards, including tropical and extratropical cyclones, represent the deadliest and costliest types of natural hazards. However, that's not to say flooding and other types of storms don't count either. They all count. <clears throat> if we want to protect uh, our coasts and to make them resilient, we have to look at extreme weather. And so this session presents an Atlantic framework of the proposed missions, resilience to coastal natural hazards with uh, this session kind of providing a framework our participants will discuss, discuss examples, provide recommendations, and talk about knowledge to increase our understanding of processes and prediction with the hope that this will help us in addressing resilience for the blue economy. It's clear that if we can't protect coastlines, that the blue economy will have real difficulty in the long run, whether those are coastal communities or the infrastructure. So, um, as some of you might know, this has been a record uh, Atlantic hurricane season, and we currently have a major hurricane uh, that's uh, impacting the Yucatan. In fact, some of the speakers today couldn't actually be on because of the hurricane. Uh, and so this is, this is a real situation. So I'm going to get started. Our first speaker is Dr. Giovanni Copini. He is currently at CMN, CMCC, the European Mediterranean Center for Climate Change. And he's the director for OPA, or the Office of Oceans Predictions and Applications. Each speaker will go for about 10 to 12 minutes. You can add Q&A uh, in the chat box, or if you're an attendee, you'll see a place where you can ask your questions. Please do so. Uh, we'll answer those at the end of the, the presentations. And also, I'll ask you to go through the survey at the end of the session. So without further ado, let's get started with Giovanni. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for the nice introduction. Just confirm that you can see my screen. Is it okay? Yeah. So uh, I will briefly introduce you to uh, our work on modeling and forecasting sea level extreme events in the coastal ocean. So the work has been mainly done by Ivan Federico and the group. But of course, I will tell also about uh, uh, Copernicus, that is uh, our basic service uh, that we use to further exploit and forecast. And I wanted to mention also the collaboration with the University of Bologna and Georgia Tech Institute in the US uh, that uh, are collaborating with us in this uh, activity. Let me find a way. Okay, so I will present several case studies. I will focus first on Savannah area in, in Georgia, US, and show you how we set up the model, very uh, high resolution model in the coastal areas, and just at the end go through several cases, uh, both in US and in Europe, in the Azores, and in the Mediterranean. So not only Atlantic, but also a bit of Mediterranean today. And then some short conclusion. So Copernicus first. The Copernicus Marine Service is a European service that provides observation and forecast and reanalysis in the worldwide. So with a coverage that is global and, and then for the regional seas. Today, we will show how to exploit the global and the Mediterranean product as a basically boundary condition for downscaling and the short-term forecast. So we will use the uh, global Copernicus uh, analysis and forecasting that uh, are updated daily. So the top left product at 112 uh, of a degree. So physics here means uh, ocean sea level and currents and temperature and so on. As well, we will use the Mediterranean show results and, and use the Mediterranean forecasting system that is run within Copernicus by my institute uh, uh, at CMCC uh, in Italy. And these are the typical products uh, of, uh, of an ocean model. 
So uh, going uh, uh, to Georgia and US, the Savannah River area is uh, uh, a very uh, complex uh, hydrodynamic coastal areas with uh, uh, the river coming through and a fragmented, let's say, uh, coastal area with the uh, saltwater marshes and important uh, 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 cities and ports in the area. He, uh, here you see some pictures. So how can we uh, model and forecast this area in terms of ocean modeling? So uh, sea level and currents and so on. What we use is this Schiffen model, is an unstructured grid model. This means that uh, uh, the grid that you might see is a triangular grid and uh, the size of the, uh, of the triangular decrease going to the coastal areas and in the river. So we are able to move from a three kilometer resolution offshore to 10, 20 meters inshore. So very, very high resolution, able then to model the flow of the water in these areas. Here you see the bathymetry. So a very complex bathymetry that is important, of course, in the coastal areas and a zoom in, in the coastal areas where you can see the, uh, appreciate the, 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 the resolution uh, of, the, of the grid sense. And uh, here are some examples. So we set up years ago, a couple of years ago, a prototype of an operational forecasting system is called Switch. And uh, it's able to forecast currents, sea temperature, and sea level. The boundary conditions are provided daily by the Copernicus Global Ocean Models. And we use climatology for the moment being as river input. So the model is full 3D and it goes up to the river. So you model the water from the river um, source point, let's say, into the ocean. Here are some examples. Here are the website where every day you can find the results. And here an example of uh, uh, currents, temperature, salinity, and sea level. And some zoom in, in the coastal areas. Here you see how can change very rapidly the uh, currents, the ocean dynamics uh, in, in the coastal areas. So with the currents, of course, the model has tides and the tides are included in the, in the downscale models. And here you see the, the, the currents changing. Okay, first uh, comparison is a, let's say a standard period with the, you see that the, the comparison of sea level uh, during uh, um, a certain period, a few days, uh, compared with the tide gauge at Fort, uh, Fort Pulaski. Now, when we go to the, to the major events that we have been reconstructed, this is Matthew Hurricane on the left in 2016 and Dorian Hurricane uh, recently in 2019. So you see that uh, in the upper panel, uh, you have the um, NCEP uh, wind velocity, you see the position of the hurricane is different. And immediately you can uh, see below the different uh, reaction of the impacts on the ocean. So with the uh, uh, high speed uh, offshore uh, in the case of Matthew. And uh, uh, since the hurricane was positioned a bit offshore, uh, the high speed was more relevant or more up, um, evident in the coastal areas. Uh, uh, here you see the, uh, the, the track of the hurricane. You can see that they travel in different, farther from the coast, the Dorian one, and even slower. And uh, um, in the position of the tide gauge. Then some comparison. So here you see the observed uh, water level from the tide gauge in Fort Polanski for Matthew and uh, the tide prediction, so the astronomic tide in red, and uh, uh, what we call the, the water uh, uh, level anomalies uh, from north. So that's the maximum you see that uh, uh, Matthew was, uh, uh, mm, uh, let's say, higher surge, and, uh, um, and Matthew surge co-occurs with the high and low tides uh, for Matthew. So higher, sorry, for Matthew and low for Dorian. 
Here are the results of our model. So uh, just to recap, we have been forcing the model with the ECNWF uh, analysis uh, and uh, with the CMEMS uh, Copernicus Global uh, model with uh, using a one hour frequency for SSH uh, um, boundary plus astronomical tides as the boundary. And you see how nicely the, 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 the switch system is able to focus both Matthew and Dorian. Uh, the maximum here you see, uh, and even the, the decrease of water level after the passage, while Dorian was less evident because even in the tide gate, I mean, the, the impact was much lower in Dorian. Now, uh, this year we have been forecasting the passage of uh, Isaias uh, hurricane. Uh, uh, here you see the maximum uh, uh, of the, the model compared with the astronomical tides. And, uh, uh, sorry, and, uh, and the tide gauge. I don't see it very well in the picture, but uh, uh, yeah. Here it's compared uh, the model and the tide gauge. So, uh, last two examples that I wanted to show, if I still have time, yeah, are the uh, Lorenzo hurricane that impacted the Azore Islands and the Jonas Medicaid of a few weeks ago. Here we are uh, in the Azore area, and uh, in uh, October 2019, you see the uh, this is our CMCC global ocean model. And you see the passage, I mean, the signal of the passage of the hurricane in the ocean model. So this is SST, you see the decrease in ocean temperature, the signature of the hurricane passage, and even the currents are uh, affected. Now, in the same way, we downscale the, the model using, uh, uh, we downscale the Copernicus model uh, with Chifem and also with Wayward Strait. We, we watch three wave models uh, in this area of the Azores. Uh, and here you see the results. So we have, uh, uh, just to show the difference between the global model, the Copernicus one, uh, uh, that is not able to reproduce the, the increase on sea level, uh, while the Schiffer model with tides uh, is able to do that. These are three points. Of course, the last one is not uh, uh, clearly, is far uh, from the, the event. Here you see the, uh, the sea level impact uh, increase, let's say, also detected by sea level anomaly track from a remote sensor, from satellite, while in the Copernicus system is not evident. Last uh, event was the Mediterranean uh, uh, extratropical cyclone, so the Medicaid, so-called. It, uh, it occurred last month, September 2020. Here you see the impact on currents, surface currents and sea level. So, uh, and you see it in the map and in the, in the time series where you see this increase both in, in uh, the water velocity and, uh, and sea level in the, in the points marked with the star. Uh, this is the Copernicus system. So already the Copernicus system in the Mediterranean, even if, if, if it is without tides, is able to reproduce this increase of sea level. Uh, and you see also when approaching the coastal areas, uh, uh, it's very evident, uh, both the, the tide, uh, in the currents and in the, in the sea level of about uh, uh, 20 centimeters uh, of surge. In the area uh, for another project, uh, uh, not for storm surge, but we had uh, already implemented and running operational high resolution uh, uh, forecasting system. So that goes to a few hundred meters of resolution downscale from the Copernicus map. And here you see the impact uh, in the ocean sea level uh, as well in currents. And uh, in the different points, of course, the, here you see the astronomical tides below and uh, the model results, uh, not yet compared with the, with the tide gauge, but because there are a few, there is only one here, we will do that. But still very evident, the, about 30 centimeters surge 
is uh, is uh, is evident and detected by the model. So just to conclude, uh, what we think is useful in this case, so to model the extreme uh, weather events in the coastal area, is a, a cross-scale approach. So to go from the open ocean to the coastal uh, and river and uh, scale. Uh, today, we are able to do high resolution short-term forecast, a few days in advance, uh, able to detect the impact of uh, hurricane and medicane in the coastal areas. Uh, it's a complex system, so it's really important to, to combine the different best information of uh, uh, atmospheric forcing uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and the ocean modeling together because, uh, I mean, sometimes, for instance, the, the, the surge might occur or not at the high tides, so it's very important to have a, a system that includes all the different components. Of course, it will be, uh, as, as, um, let's say, several events has been studied, uh, and uh, I think we are now operational in many parts of the Mediterranean and, and worldwide, and this should be extended. Uh, the coupling with the hydrological component is fundamental, so we are investing in, in coupling with, the, with the, for instance, World Hydro and, uh, and different uh, national system, uh, both in Europe and US. Ensemble modeling approach uh, uh, also carried out in the Mediterranean, but I think it is very important. Uh, this is a technical, but of course the grid, the Zeta star is a way of, uh, of uh, representing the, uh, the vertical grid of the model is very important when we want to model also the water on land. It is uh, may maybe more relevant for the, uh, the parallel session on flooding, but uh, it's very relevant in the coastal areas. Uh, and, uh, and of course, is, uh, is relevant when we want to model the water flow and, uh, and sea level changes in the marshes or in the urban areas. Last but not least, we are focusing also on the interoperability of the service. So these outputs of the model are uh, uh, available, let's say, for users uh, in an in interoperable manner, meaning that any GIS system should be able to upload this data and display using so on. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we had a technical glitch at the beginning of the session. And so I just want to step back and then introduce again uh, what this session is about. Um, the live stream went out, so take one or two minutes just to introduce, and then we'll have Dr. Jenny Evans give her presentation. So let me just, oh, uh, she, yes. So I just wanna show you what this is about and we'll, it will provide additional context for the speakers. And so again, this is a thematic session on resilience, natural hazards, natural coastal hazards focus on extreme weather. And I just want to show you this picture here. This is from June 7th, 2020. And it shows two types of hazards. Uh, in the Eastern Atlantic, we have a very large dust event. And in the Gulf of Mexico, we actually have a tropical cyclone. And this is the connection between Africa and the downstream areas. Um, this picture below just kind of gives a sense that at any time, you know, we could have extreme events affecting a population without much warning. And that's really the point of this session because again, the coastal resilience is largely tied to the prediction and the communication of hazards to populations. But this is an event that happened in June, around June the 17th, 18th, 19th. This was on the ground at the top and below it, you can actually see the dust going across the Atlantic. So. It went from Eastern Atlantic to Western Atlantic uh, mm -hmm. in a matter of seven or eight days. Oops.
So uh, that was a matter of minutes. Um, and then in terms of the rest of the tropical season, we saw all kinds of, of events that, that impacting the Atlantic from the Eastern, from the Eastern Atlantic, uh, places like uh, Cape Verde, Senegal, uh, leading to fatalities. Uh, here's a picture where we had many different tropical cyclones at once on a given day. And that picture at the bottom is uh, in Louisiana. So just wanted to uh, uh, to stop, uh, see, stop this share and to just give you a kind of background leading to the session. So next we have Dr. Jenny Evans from Penn State University. Uh, Dr. Evans is our former AMS president for the centennial year. Uh, she is in my department, Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Sciences. And she also runs the Institute, well, it used to be called the Institute for Cyber Science, but it changed the name. Um, so she's, she's gonna give her presentation now. So uh, Jenny, you're on. It turns out I can't unmute if I have my presentation up, so. There we go. So what I wanna to talk to you all about today is to how to improve hurricane forecasts to uh, build resilience um, using machine learning. And I wanna talk about some weather systems that affect most of the North Atlantic. So you're all familiar with this kind of a map. This is 21 years of tropical systems in the Atlantic. Um, we only see Katerina in the South Atlantic since it goes through 2005, but we know there are more systems now. I wanna focus on the North Atlantic. You can see, of course, systems forming off uh, West Africa. Those tend to be the most intense systems in the basin. You can see much activity in the tropics, but I want to focus further north in the extra tropics mm -hmm. on so many systems that are beginning their life in the tropics and ending their life even up in Scandinavia and in Western Europe. Um, you can see these are what we're calling tropical cyclones that undergo extra tropical transition. So in terms of coastal resilience, of course, you get landfalls where we expect, but you're also getting landfalls all the way up into Canada. And as I said, over in Western Europe and in the very Northwest even of uh, Africa. So extra tropically transitioning tropical cyclones are about 45% of the total number of systems that form in the Atlantic tropics. And about half of those make landfall. So this was a strong motivation for looking further into these systems. So another reason to worry about them is that as they go from tropical to extra tropical, their structure changes in a way that can have them affect larger numbers of people. So this is Hurricane Danielle. This is the surface winds. Blue are gales, green are storm force, red are hurricane force. So even at 34 North, you can see that Danielle is quite symmetric and has hurricane force winds near the center. As it moves further out of the tropics, it first intensifies and then begins to weaken in the Canadian Maritimes and starts to lose its symmetric character, as you'd expect with it moving into cooler water and increased shear. Continues to weaken as we'd expect, but then um, so six days later, or not six days later, um, anyway, three days later, 
It's back to the pressure it had at 34 north. It's now up at about 45 north. And you can see an expansion of the gale force winds and a return of the hurricane force winds near the center. So what you're seeing then is this transitioning event having a much larger area of damaging winds. And I'm not showing it here, but equivalently, the rainfall structure expands with heavy rain over a much larger area than in the tropics. Oops. So this is just a few examples of uh, extratropically transitioning systems in the last couple of decades. And, and in particular showing the impacts in the Eastern Atlantic, as well as the ones that we know well in the Western Atlantic. Something to notice here in particular is that these events forming in the deep tropics, you know, such as Katerina or Maria um, or Sandy, which I'll talk about more in a minute, uh, affect multiple locations, often multiple countries, and affect them dramatically. And so, you know, this leads to uh, many millions of people in the region being impacted. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, these extratropically transitioning hurricanes can have these devastating impacts in many countries, much larger areas of strong winds that can also lead to the storm surge impacts that Giovanni was just talking about, also heavy rain um, and the, another key thing in terms of forecasting is that these systems are moving, uh, accelerating dramatically as they move out of tropics. They're being impacted by a mid-latitude trough and that leads them to accelerate. So all of this increases the uncertainty in the forecast. It's increased because the storm's accelerating and because its structure is changing so dramatically. Um, so it's important to understand the uncertainty in these forecasts. And so we do that by creating many in, in even hundreds of forecasts of a single event, but with very slightly different initial conditions. Now, if you've got 150 forecasts and you have to deliver a forecast, um, processing all that information can be overwhelming. And so what my group have been doing is using machine learning to reduce this set. And I'm gonna use the 150 forecast example to a few distinct options. And so I'm gonna show you today an example using six, that ends up with six options and I'll show you how, but we've done it ending up with as few as four. And um, the process we're going to use is what we call path clustering. So you can see the track of Hurricane Sandy on the right, and you can see how many countries it impacted uh, before making landfall over the life cycle of Sandy, about uh, 280, more than 200 and peop 280 people lost their lives. And between the Caribbean and the US and Canada, um, many millions were impacted by this storm. So on the left, you see the 150 forecasts that were produced by a number of global models. So we're using here the US model, the Canadian model, the UK model, and the European center, combining all of those. And you can see the difficulty with uh, developing a forecast with those many events and, and that much spread, everything from landfall you know, as a tropical system far south to going out to sea and dissipating. So what we do is we've developed this process called path clustering. What you see here is the result of that path clustering um, and coming up with six different events. So we take the entire track of the, the forecast track, five-day forecast track for each case, and we compare them using a um, statistical algorithm to find which of them are the most similar to each other and the most different to everyone else. And so that's how we come up with these six cases. And just to make it easier to see, the red, each of these, the dot is where the time at which the real storm, which is the black case, 
made landfall. And you can see the red uh, has only three events and it, three members and it moves too quickly and is tropical. The orange never makes landfall and again has very few members. So I'll very quickly show you what happens with magenta, blue, uh, cyan and green as we look at the forecast for those. Now I'm only gonna show you two uh, sets of images. So this is what Hurricane Sandy looked like at landfall. And this is when it was extra tropically transitioning. Now, if you hear NHC forecasts, they'll call this a post tropical Sandy. So what you see here, the colors are signifying temperature. So the oranges, yellows, reds are tropical air and the blues and purples are air from higher latitudes. So you can see the cold air wrapping around the bottom, but the warm tropical air staying with Sandy. And the contours are showing you a representation or a signified pressure. So this is the same image made for each of those groups of storms. So the left one is the 19 uh, forecasts. This is an average of the 19 forecasts in magenta and here for the 26 for blue, 13 for cyan, seven for green. And you can see importantly that each of these panels looks very different from the other one. So cyan, uh, green stays tropical for much longer. It's not getting into as cold a water and it's not hitting land. And on the other hand, magenta gets there more quickly. So which one looks the most like the actual system on the right. So this is what really happened. It turns out that if you compare them, the blue, which has the most number of, of forecasts, compares very well with what actually happened. Very quickly, if you look at what the model generates in terms of a radar pattern, um, you can see again, the magenta is similar but the blue looks quite a lot more like what actually happened down here. It doesn't capture um, the signature so much further inland, but it's doing a, quite a good job of, of showing you what's happening in the rainfall at landfall. Um, okay, so just to summarize, uh, I've only shown you one case. We've done hundreds of cases. So this is an example, not an exception. Um, so Hurricane Sandy was a difficult forecast with many um, devastating consequences. We have done the same thing for the forecasts that are in the deep tropics, but um, this is a paper that we wrote, so I'm grabbing images from there. Um, so by partitioning those many forecasts, we're able to come up with a very simple summary of the synoptics of the transition and to provide a synthesis of the options that the forecast ensemble gives. These are different physical evolutions and the one that is most likely to represent reality. And that's just a summary of what I've said and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Evans. Um, our next speaker in the panel is Nuno Moria. Moria. He is the head of the Division of Meteorological mm -hmm. Forecasting, Surveillance and Space Services at the Portuguese Institute of Sea and the Atmosphere. Nuno, you're up. Um, hello, everyone. Um, a former head, just to correct. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, my hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, my question, my presentation today uh, has this title: Portugal and Atlantic Extreme Weather Lab. Um, and in the next minutes, I will try to explain you why why I, I chose this uh, this title. I, I, it's a, a teaser title, I guess. Uh, but you'll, you'll, let you, you'll let me know if you agree with that in the end. I will show you a couple of cases just about extreme weather in Portugal. So I will, I will, I will start with exotropical storms. 
um, and showing that Portugal is in the track of these extratropical storms. The image that you have uh, it represents the spatial distribution of the position where rapid cyclogenesis which their minimum central pressure. So we're talking about these extreme cases of exotropical storms, also known as bombs. And you can see, of course, the uh, he, part of the Northern Atlantic is affected by, by these rapid cyclogenesis events. And you can see that particular uh, Portugal, here is mainland, here is the Azores, are uh, affected by, by it. So on average, uh, one rapid cyclogenesis every one or two wet seasons happens to us. In our case, only Madeira, which is somewhere around here, uh, is not in this map. So it's outside the shaded area. So, but at least uh, Azores and mainlands are affected. Also, um, um, uh, in some exotropical storms, uh, there are sting jets uh, and uh, we were affected by one of these sting jets um, in December uh, 2009. So more than 10 years ago. So this is an example very, that had a lot of impact uh, in our in our in our country. There were maximum wind gusts of 200 kilometers per hour in a private station. In official station, just 140 kilometers per hour, um, and uh, there were more than 100 million euros of economic losses um, in this particular case. So just a few hours, and uh, this this was the impact: million euros in in our case. Um, of course, Portugal is also in the tornado tracks. So this is a, um, an overview that was made uh, and it was out just this summer uh, with almost 200 reported tornadoes in 20 years, which gives you an average of almost 10 a year. Um, and um, of course, it's also including water spouts here in, in the map, as you can see. Um, and um, in a nutshell, uh, we could say that in Portugal, uh, F1 are, tornadoes are the most frequent and F3 are the most intense. Uh, and you have an example here on a tornado, uh, on a reference on a tornado on December two, 2010, an F3, the, the, the most intense that we had. Um, we, in the other, on the other hand, um, we had, I mentioned you the exotropical storms, uh, but we are also affected by atmospheric rivers. So it's more, instead of going to the upper part, of, of the, or the northern part of the Atlantic, just focusing more on the southern part. And you see here that uh, the mean duration of atmospheric rivers uh, in mainland Portugal, on the Azores or in Madeira, it's from 16 to 20 hours when they happen. They happen more frequently in the Azores. So the frequency is, is higher in the Azores, slightly lower in mainland Madeira. But one of the very tragic cases that we had was this flash flood in Madeira that you might remember in 2010. Uh, we had 42 casualties, 1,000 million euros of economic losses, so uh, big value here. And in fact, this atmospheric river had an uh, the mesoscale convective system that was embedded uh, in, in it, and it was a very dramatic situation in, in Portugal, in this case in Madeira. Uh, but the, the, the floods are also happening in the mainland, of course. Um, this is a very recent case, ju just last year, in, in December last year. Um, this is the total precipitation in, a couple, in, ma in many days. I, I think it's seven to eight days. And it was uh, related to three named storms. That's something that we are doing right now for a couple of years in Europe. Um, so it was Danielle, Elsa, and Fabien. The total precipitation was around 20 millimeters in two days, 400 millimeters in eight days. And what we had is, was this kind of flooding. It's in the, in the basin here of Mondego. It's a river here in the center. And it was a, a very uh, impacting uh, situation for us. Uh, the economic losses raised uh, to around 50 million euros. Uh, of course, um, and we already heard many, many, many cases from hurricanes or tropical cyclones uh, in, the, in the previous presentations. And you, we know that the Azores are usually affected by tropical cyclones. However, in recent years, there were some Portuguese firsts on this, on this topic. And uh, in the next minutes, I will, I will show you uh, a couple of these firsts uh, on tropical cyclones on, on the Portuguese point of view. So we had uh, Hurricane Gordon in 2006, and again, another Hurricane Gordon in 2012. This is just a curiosity. Um, of course, there was some impact in the first one mainly, 
uh, but the two hurricanes with the same name affected the same uh, area, it's the Azores, and even the same group, it's the, the most eastern group. Um, of course, they, they hit with the category one, although they had uh, higher categories, uh, higher intensity in, in the Atlantic, and this is mainly a curiosity here. Um, one of the things that, uh, however, is the, the main uh, issue for us in terms of, of tropical cyclones is, is winds in October 2005. This is the year of Katrina, as you, as you, as you know. And uh, Vince was around 200 kilometers of Madeira, which I just mentioned. Madeira is right here, this island. It's uh, a little north of, uh, of the Canary Islands. And it was 200 kilometers from it, so passed very close. Uh, and it was the first tropical cyclone that reached the Iberian Peninsula later uh, on, the, on, on that month. In fact, this uh, tropical cyclone was a first warning for us in Portugal outside the Azores. So we are all used to have this information. Azores is the, the archipelago that is usually affected by tropical cyclones. And this was, this was the first warning. So 15 years ago, um, we had this uh, wake up call and uh, Jenny already mentioned it about the, the, tr the transitions and the, all this uh, relation to the, to the extratropical uh, environment. And it was a wake up call for hybrid storms for us. Um, it was really embedded in an extratropical trough, as you can see here. And the sea surface, sea surface temperature was not on this 26 degrees <laughs> uh, threshold that we tried to put in our heads, but uh, with the values of 23 to 24. Again, we had in 2016 a new, a new, a new thing. It was Alex. It was the first hurricane in the Atlantic in January, uh, according to the National Hurricane Center. Um, it passed again in the Azores uh, archipelago, mainly between islands. The, the impact was not that great. But the thing here is that uh, it was January, um, to, to, to the first one that it formed in January. Next year, 2017, we had Ophelia, and uh, Jenny also uh, mentioned this as an, an extra-tropical uh, transition, an extra-tropical transition. Um, and, and Ophelia was uh, classified as the most eastern category three hurricane in the Atlantic, again, according to the National Hurricane Center. Um, it passed to the south of the Azores, as you can see here. Uh, then it moved west of, west of mainland, Portugal, and then went to affect Ireland with a big impact in Ireland. However, before getting there, um, Ophelia had a, a big and devastating impact on wildfires in mainland. And that's a, a connection that we might not expect uh, to happen. So um, these wildfires were originate, originated 50 victims. Uh, and the, the issue here regarding Ophelia is that Ophelia was passing uh, close enough to the, sh to, the, to the coast, so the winds from the south were increasing uh, enough, but it was not too close, so the precipitation was not happening over, over, over land. So we had, in this case, it was the, the day after this image, it was on the 15th of October, we had the worst uh, case in terms of uh, forest fire risk uh, in Portugal in the last, let's say, almost 20 years. So it was really a, a very uh, unusual uh, combination, an uh, unexpected combination um, that we would have between hurricanes and forest fires. The next year was in 2018, so now is, is roughly an example per year, we had Leslie. Leslie uh, was the closest ever hurricane off the coast of main, mainland Portugal. I, I, I say that it was in our backyard. It made a transition before making landfall, so to a post-tropical storm, so we cannot say that uh, according to the rules, uh, it was Le Leslie made landfall as a hurricane. I just said it was in our backyard, um, but the, the, the impacts were very strong. Again, we had the stronger winds related to a sting jet um, and the highest wind gust was of 176 kilometers per hour, which was the, 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 the highest value ever recorded officially uh, in Portugal, but it didn't finish. So uh, in fact, last year, as you know, we had the Azores, uh, in the Azores, Hurricane Lorenzo already mentioned in, the, in these days. Uh, and these two tropical cyclones, uh, Leslie and Lorenzo, they, they had, uh, they sum to around 450 million euros uh, of economic losses. And this was due in Portugal, Azores and mainland, 
due to two storms in less than one year. So it's basically October, the month we are right now. Um, so one year ago and two years ago. If you, will, if you want to have an idea of this, what this, this value means in terms of the Portuguese economy, let's say, I, I just give you here an example. It's 50% of a governmental support measure, that's 1,000 million euros, that has been released in June this year for small and medium-sized enterprises uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So just two storms get to 50% of this uh, governmental support measure. I am now going to finish just with a few sentences. Final remarks. Well, it's a fact. These are very straightforward sentences, but I think it's usual. It's very important to, to state them. So um, extreme weather has, of course, large impacts in society and the economy. Um, extreme weather will continue and according to climate change scenarios likely to increase in frequency. So therefore society must clearly increase preparedness to face and adapt to the extreme weather. And also as better observations and better forecasts can reduce impact in real time. And we just seen Jenny Evans showing as a very interesting uh, tool for the future. Um, I, I'm sure that uh, these national meteorological services, I'm representing one, the Portuguese one, IPMA, the, 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 the outputs from these services will clearly be benefit from this research and improved observations. Very straightforward, very clear sentences. Very, I think we can agree with this, but I think it, it should be interesting to put them in, in, my, in the final part of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's very interesting. Uh, quite often we don't hear the results of these systems uh, in Europe over in the US. So thank you very much. Uh, next, thank you. we have Dr. Mark Richard. Uh, he is actually a Penn State alum. And so he was under the mentorship of Dr. Jenny Evans. So it's kind of a very interesting connection here. But in addition, when they're talking about extra tropical transitions or tropical systems, Bermuda tends to get the, the worst of both worlds in a sense, or the best of both worlds. So we'll, we'll, we'll uh, shoot over to Mark. And uh, Mark is currently the director of the Bermuda Weather Service. Um, and so we'll hear right uh, from the front lines. Thank you very much, Greg. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna give a, uh, a general introduction to Bermuda, uh, the Bermuda Weather Service and our experience with hurricanes. And I'm gonna try to put this in the context of climate change and uh, resilience of uh, Bermuda, a small island in the middle of the North Atlantic. Um, so I'll kick right off here. So uh, first, a, a very brief overview of Bermuda itself. We're a, a small archipelago uh, we're about 54 square kilometers and about 1,000 uh, kilometers away from the closest point of land. Uh, that's North Carolina in the United States. We have a very uh, uh, mild climate, a subtropical climate due to our proximity to the, the Gulf Stream. Um, we're right at 32 North, which puts us nicely in the zone between uh, sort of tropical weather and mid-latitude weather. You'll hear a bit more about that shortly. Uh, but it also, that, that warm water uh, enables us to have a fringing uh, coral reef, and Bermuda itself is a is a, um, a subsurface um, a volcano, so a dormant volcano that um, that is uh, capped with a coral reef, um, and so it's a pedestal in the deep ocean, uh, surrounded by uh, waters getting to depths of uh, around four kilometers. We're a self-governing British overseas territory, which means that we, um, although we're not technically a nation state, uh, we do have our own uh, elected uh, government officials, our own parliament. Uh, we have uh, a GDP of about six and a half billion, most of which is uh, contributed to by international business, uh, mainly finance and insurance, and also tourism. Uh, it was interesting to hear the comments about uh, economic impacts of tropical cyclones uh, we have had instances in the past where we've had uh, up to 10% of our GDP be affected uh, directly in terms of economic damages um, uh, by, a, by a hurricane impact. The Bermuda Weather Service, I want to give a, a brief uh, introduction to that as well. 
uh, the operation that I'm in charge of. Um, as with many small islands, uh, the requirements for us to have our own meteorological services stems from the needs, uh, the legislated and regulated needs to provide weather information in support of aviation safety and air navigation. So uh, that is the reason that we're a section of the Bermuda Airport Authority. Um, those resources that are needed for aviation services um, enable the development of 24 seven uh, provision of public and marine uh, weather services as well for um, the, um, the observations, forecasts, and uh, warning services um, uh, against a wide range of natural hazards, not just hurricanes, um, uh, severe winds, um, uh, ocean events, uh, including we're, we're also actually the tsunami warning uh, center, uh, point, uh, focal point of contact for Bermuda as well. So we have a, a large degree of responsibility for such a small, um, a small island. And we use both traditional and sort of more sophisticated uh, meteorological methods to, to undertake some of those observations and forecasts. Here you can see in the, um, the graphics that you've got on the screen now, on the top left, you see the, um, as represented on our Doppler uh, radar, we have um, the eye of Hurricane Paulette just a few weeks ago, moving right across the center of the island or right across the island. You can see the island's outline in the center of that eye. Um, and then to the right of that, you can see a model representation of Hurricane Teddy, which we, we had um, make a close approach just a couple of weeks ago. So we've had two uh, hurricane impacts in the last, um, the last month. Uh, the image on the right with, with Teddy shows the wind field surrounding um, that particular storm and uh, to the sort of, if you can see my mouse, to the, to the bottom right of Bermuda, which is at the center of this panel. And then to the, to the north and west, the, the sort of top left of this panel, you can see uh, gale, mid-latitude gale force winds coming in behind Teddy. With Bermuda right in the middle, it, it nicely demonstrates that we are uh, privy to, let's say, um, both tropical type weather and mid-latitude type uh, weather impacts. And uh, I'm, I was very pleased to see um, discussions from Jenny about extra tropical transition. We certainly do get those, uh, those types of uh, transitions happening uh, near or in some cases right over Bermuda, um, subtropical storms, extra tropical storm uh, transitions, and uh, indeed full-blown hurricanes sometimes. In terms of um, Bermuda, and our experience with hurricanes, uh, one of the reasons that uh, we uh, think of ourselves as being quite resilient is that we're experienced. Uh, we've been now, I believe Paulette was the 100th hurricane that we've um, had to deal with that, is, that has been a threat um, since we've been recording them. Uh, and this awareness of and the preparedness for hurricanes has built itself into our seasonal activities, our our hardened architecture and our very way of life. Uh, we have uh, stone architecture. I think we learned after the first hundred years worth of hurricanes the hard way um, to build out of the stone, uh, that the limestone that, that makes up the landscape in Bermuda. Um, and those, uh, those buildings are rated to uh, quite a strong uh, building code. Um, in addition, we have no major freshwater bodies for drinking water. So that architecture uh, itself has um, has built within it uh, rooftop rainwater catchments and underwater um, uh, under sorry underground um, drinking water cisterns as, as well. Um, so that that kind of um, self sufficiency has been built into our very uh, the very building code that we we use. Uh, it's also worth noting that. Uh, you know, we've got this sense of awareness and preparedness around hurricanes that uh, appears now to be sort of ingrained in our national psyche, especially after the last 20 years of heightened activity. There certainly have been periods of complacency, which have come coincident with lulls in hurricane activity. However, we are now uh, pretty practiced, we're practiced enough now that we know what to do when a hurricane approaches. So that's one of the elements of our resilience here in Bermuda. Another, uh, perhaps, counterintuitive element of our resilience is um, our size and isolation. So it, it seems counterintuitive because being small and isolated doesn't, doesn't immediately spring to mind as, as sort of lending itself towards resiliency. But 
isolation actually builds um, self-sufficiency, as as I talked about with the, the building code. Um, and the smallness leads to uh, lends itself to agility. It means that uh, you know physically we can get easily to places that need damage assessment. It means that supplies are close to hand, assuming they exist on island. Um, and in this particular example, in the, the photograph here, you can see supplies that we gathered within, I think it was 48 hours. Um, we had 2,000 tons of supplies relief supplies for our neighbors to the southwest, the Bahamas, after their devastating impact from Hurricane Dorian. And the fact that we were able to gather as a small country, able to gather this, this, uh, um, this measure of relief supplies in a very short period of time speaks to our agility. Um, but I guess most importantly, in my opinion, uh, our smallness means that we're actually very well connected. We help our neighbors out, we check, uh, we check on them. Um, when they need assistance. Um, and it means that we have uh, strong internal partnerships. What you see here on the left is the whole, the entire emergency measures organization all in one room, um, and including everyone from the premier to the minister of national security, um, to the head of the weather service, to the police, to the regiment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because we're such a small place, we have the ability to um, really know who we're dealing with. Um, we can leverage uh, those internal partnerships to navigate from information gathering to decision making to action in a few very easy steps rather than going through several layers of bureaucracy. Uh, we know who we're dealing with and we have a connection with them uh, more closely than perhaps in a, in a larger country. Uh, we've also got a two-way external connection with the rest of the world that actually belies our, our isolation. Um, using a professional example of the, the relationships we have at the, the Bermuda Weather Service uh, with the US National Hurricane Center, the UK Met Office, the Caribbean Meteorological Organization and, and others uh, enable us to access expertise and information that originates beyond our shores and to, to feed our knowledge, and our knowledge and our data to the wider world. And this is particularly evident in, in, um, during Hurricane Paulette just a few weeks ago um, when despite we had a, us having a telecommunications issue, we were able to still pass data and imagery directly to the National Hurricane Center. And they used that in their increasing of the frequency of regular updates uh, in the interest of public safety. So let's think about some things that threaten that resilience. And of course, I'm, I'm kind of gonna talk mostly about climate change here. Um, the, uh, what you see here is the ocean temperature anomalies near the Bermuda Atlantic time series, which is taken, uh, which is uh, monitored by uh, the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences. And you can see those anomalies increasing over time. That's not really a surprise. We all know that the ocean is warming in the Atlantic, but here's some, um, here's a specific data point near Bermuda that we're, we're, um, we're focused on that ocean temperature um, increasing. And in sort of seemingly in lockstep with that, we're seeing an increase in the intensity of tropical cyclones uh, coming within range of Bermuda within 100 kilometers. Um, not only their, uh, their frequency seems to be increasing, but their, their intensity seems to be increasing over time. And that lends itself to more major hurricane activity uh, in the vicinity of Bermuda um, and thus more, more damage. Um, Hurricane Fabian here, incidentally, is the worst weather disaster that we had within a 50 year period. Um, and, uh, you know, that's that's the event I, I talked about earlier that, that sort of um, it caused a, a, a significant amount of damage uh, comparable to 10% of our GDP. And as a, an interesting side note, I was working with Jenny at the time at Penn State. Um, so I wasn't actually in Bermuda. I was at Penn State studying hurricanes at the time. So the Atlantic isn't just warming, it's also rising. Uh, we have uh, some measurements here from the tide gauge in uh, the east end of the island with the annual uh, average sea level uh, gradually increasing over time. Again, no surprise. And uh, more recent research indicates that that sea level is going to, uh, is going to accelerate in its, in its rise over time. And that's going to lead to an exacerbation of more uh, storm surge uh, risk and uh, it's uh, it's said that we we are are what is currently deemed an extreme event will be within the normal high tide range possibly as soon as 20 years from now in enhancing that that storm surge risk so that this is something we really are uh, taking quite seriously 
So will we always be resilient? Uh, currently, we, of course, all are being um, tested under the um, under the COVID-19 pandemic. It's one of the things that's really testing our resilience, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say our government has done very well with that. Uh, many, many more stressors that uh, that are, are being imposed on small islands, but climate change is um, is certainly one of the, the main ones that, that we should be focused on. And as uh, perhaps a controversial statement here, there, there's very little that uh, small islands like Bermuda can do it themselves to mitigate anthropogenic global warming. Um, however, there are very good economic and security reasons for reducing our carbon footprint. But with regards to our specific, specific response to climate change, uh, adaptation should be very high on the list of priorities of any small island. And uh, I'll stop there and say thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much, Mark. That was very enlightening. Um, and following Mark, we have another Mark <laughs> from South Africa. Uh, give me one second. We have uh, Mark DeFoss. Uh, he is a researcher at the Marine Unit of the South African Weather Service and a physical oceanographer by training. And he will speak to us about resilience and extreme marine weather in South Africa. Mark? Yes, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I am Mark, thanks for the introduction. And um, I'm gonna take a slightly different perspective this afternoon um, to some of the previous speakers. Um, it was certainly useful that Giovanni presented ahead of me because um, a lot of what I do is build coastal numerical models. And he covered a lot of the ideas behind um, the science involved. But um, what I really wanna talk about or get to by the end of the presentation are the next, sort of next challenges that we're busy reckoning with um, down here in South Africa, more related to what we do with forecast information um, in reaching users um, ahead of extreme weather events. And I guess the other um, difference is that um, down here, we're more concerned, uh, certainly in my part of the world, with mid-latitude cyclones and their impact on um, extreme weather and the coastline. That's not to say that our East Coast doesn't um, see the effects of tropical cyclones, but um, certainly in my field of research, uh, mid-latitude cyclones are, are, are the phenomenon that we keep our eye very closely on. So that's a brief outline of what I'd like to speak about. Um, incidentally, this photograph was taken just um, two months ago, uh, about one kilometer from where I actually live in Cape Town. Um, so I'm gonna just contextualize Cape Town and South Africa in terms of its uh, driving oceanographic and atmospheric forces. And then I'd like to take the approach of discussing an extreme event, which we saw three years ago in the interim, show you the work that we did in response to that event to try and bolster our ability to predict such events, and then follow it with an event that happened just a couple months ago, which was almost identical, um, save for the fact that we were better able to predict it. And then I'd like to end off, as I said, by looking at some of the challenges that we're still facing, um, adding value to these numerical forecasts that we're producing. So this is a very busy slide, um, starting top left, um, that is Southern Africa. And our weather that we experienced, particularly down in the Southwestern Cape, um, which if you can see my mouse is right down here, near that little coastal low pressure diagram. Our weather is very much a function of mid-latitude, um, low pressure systems, which spin off the Southern Ocean and as this large South Atlantic high pressure, uh, high pressure cell moves northwards in the winter, so these big storms from the mid latitudes coming off the Southern Ocean are able to affect and impinge on our weather um, down in South Africa. Um, those systems bring large waves, storm surge, um, and are the systems which I'm gonna talk about uh, by way, means of my two case studies. Oceanographically, also a very busy place. So probably the best known oceanographic feature is the strong um, Agullis current, one of the strongest Western boundary currents in, in the world, 
sending lots, transferring lots of energy polewards and spinning off these large mesoscale ocean eddies, transferring lots of heat and also nutrients um, into the South Atlantic Ocean. That makes for a very dynamic region. Um, we've got lots of large scale drivers operating over different um, time scales and at different times. Um, so certainly a lot to keep our eye on. So the SOARS Marine Unit, South African Weather Service Marine Unit, was established um, kind of in response to the growing need to robustly predict these kinds of coastal stresses. And we're positioned somewhere between applied science and the users. And the reason we were able to do that is because we actually sit next door to the forecasting office. And one of the characteristics of a small service and not having the luxury of, of large working groups is that you kind of have to be a jack of all trades. So while we do applied um, research, we're also in frequent contact with the forecasters and by definition, the people that they're talking to on the telephones and answering emails from. So we interact very frequently with, with our user base and um, we try and approach our R&D work um, with their concerns front of mind. So this is the storm that I wanted to talk about prior to the spinning up of our unit, which was formally only established at the beginning of 2018. In media, it was referred to as Cape Storm, uh, a play on the, the famous name for, for the area around Cape Town, the Cape of Storms. And it was basically an intense surface low pressure system which wreaked havoc for our coastline. There was loss of life, there was significant loss of infrastructure, there was um, infrastructure lost to the tune of millions of rands, which is in the order of uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, a number of fatalities, and obviously disruption to pretty much all your normal range of coastal activities. Um, if you look at the wave record on the right hand side, um, you'll see the circled points are the points associated with the storm. And what was interesting is that while the maximum wave height was sitting at around 21 point something meters, um, by no means the largest maximum wave height uh, climatologically, the significant wave height, and this plot doesn't show it very well, um, was sitting up near 13 meters. And what we saw was that the effect of that generally higher sea state or higher wave height caused more problems than isolated um, extreme wave heights, even those which were higher than the maximum wave associated with the storm. And that made, um, we thought, this storm particularly dis, uh, destructive. You can see in concert with the large waves, um, a storm surge event, if we look at this red, which is the measured water level, um, over the blue, which is the predicted tide, um, a storm surge to the tune of uh, 0.6 meters or thereabouts, which doesn't sound like a lot for um, places with high tidal ranges or places that deal with intense tropical cyclones frequently, but certainly is when your coastal infrastructure is only designed to handle a moderate tidal range and moderate surge. So, some of the key questions which we found ourselves unable to answer when forecasters were, were talking to us ahead of the storm were things like, is the global offshore wave forecast reliable? We were seeing numbers and wave directions which we hadn't seen in um, the recent past and possibly only seen by very experienced forecasters, but certainly only at times uh, prior to the availability or the wide availability of numerical uh, ocean prediction products. If the ocean forecast is reliable, how is it going to manifest in the near shore? And if you take a look at this um, graphic of the Global Wave Watch 3 product from NSEP, fantastic um, and fit for purpose at a zoomed out scale, but certainly it's not going to give you any idea of the kind of sheltering which might play out um, you know, during the storm if you're situated, for example, in Simonstown which is in the lee of the Cape Peninsula. Should people there take action? Should they not? Is the storm, are these 12, 13 meter significant wave heights gonna impinge even on sheltered areas? What is the impact of the abnormal wave direction likely to be? So very rarely down here, do we see wave heights of that magnitude 
uh, in a direction not associated with the prevailing swell direction. So normally if you're seeing a 12 meter wave signal, it's a well-developed swell signal that's propagating from the Southern Ocean. But here we had a dominant wave, spec, uh, wave uh, frequency band with a completely different direction as a function of the wind. And so the wind waves were actually completely dominating the wave spectrum and causing a forecast which was quite unique um, as far as what we'd seen previously. And you know, again, what is the effect of that gonna be given that most of the infrastructure and operations were tailored to um, deal with a wave direction which was some 90 or 120 degrees uh, different to that. Is storm surge likely? And if so, what is the spatial extent of that storm surge? And what of course is the impact of the storm surge likely to be? These were questions which we relied on experienced forecasters with an idea of the interplay between the various drivers to answer, but we certainly had no way to answer them objectively or robustly. So this is what the storm ended up looking like. This is um, that little embayment, which you would have seen in my introduction slide. You can see uh, very typical storm surge conditions, overtopping, um, fairly dangerous conditions. This video that I'm gonna play now is a lifeboat station, the only lifeboat station along a particular stretch of coastline, which was badly damaged by the storm event um, and some expensive and important infrastructure rendered unserviceable. Down here, this image uh, bottom left is a coastal road, which you can see is completely flooded. And another view of a place also close to where I live uh, near the city center of Cape Town with a vehicle swamped in a parking lot. Okay, so at that point, um, the South African Weather Service decided to spin up a um, focused marine research group. And this is a busy slide. It basically gives the, a framework for how our unit operates. But I just wanna draw your attention to the block in green here, which is essentially what our initial focus foci were and also what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So we built some high and very high resolution wave forecasting tools the kinds of tools which will be able to show you that refraction and sheltering um, at a local uh, scale. We built a high resolution water level forecasting system, storm surge forecasting system, and of course, as part and parcel of that, the tide forecasting system. And um, to drive all of that, um, I'm not gonna go into the technical detail of boundary conditions and so forth, but the atmospherics are provided by the South African Weather Service um, four kilometer resolution unified model, which is downscaled dynamically from the UK METS global unified model. So this was the result. Um, we provide 72 hour high resolution forecasts and obviously um, seven day forecasts at lower resolution for significant wave heights, mean absolute period, peak period, the normal range of, of wave um, statistics we provide um, and we update these all of these forecasts twice daily. Um, water level forecasts, tired forecasts, and storm surge forecasts. That's the link to our website. And of the strength of the operational systems, we were also able to deliver some tailored services for specialized marine operations. So those might be port operators or um, shipping companies, for example, who are interested in even in a, in a higher level of detail than what we're providing for free. We also show our research as a research group on the webpage because we use the methodology of um, publishing in peer reviewed literature as a way to kind of um, ensure that those products which we're putting out into the public domain are fit for purpose. One minute. Okay, three years down the line, we have um, another system, uh, almost identical dynamically, and we were able to forecast it um, quite effectively as a result of the work which we'd done. But what I wanna get to is, um, I go through all these videos.
these challenges which we're still um, having, which is how to get people to use the products which you're putting out there more effectively and how to get the information, which is now of a higher quality, um, out into the public domain and to increase the user uptake. So what we've done is embarked on a series of um, user surveys. We've done some research into specific impacts to weather events for specific activities in different parts of the coastline as a function of different combinations and parameters in isolation. And we're trying to get to a point where we don't simply warn the entire population, but we warn specific people at specific times in light of specific forecasts um, uh, by means of some kind of objective risk index. And this project has sort of crystallized into an impact-based forecasting drive where we take the outputs from these numerical models and we are able to, with some kind of objective statistical analysis, provide a, an impact-based um, outlook for, for what to expect. And I guess the, the, the main thing that we're still struggling with is that our research has indicated that up to in the region of 70% of um, non-specialist public users of marine forecast information in the country are far more likely to use products which are presented with a nice look and feel as opposed to products which are scientifically sound. And so if we wanna have any hope of success, um, as a research group, we're actually having to spend a lot of time ensuring that the way in which we present the information, irrespective of what resolution we're producing it at, and irrespective of its um, fidelity, the, the way in which we're presenting that information is almost more important. And I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Wow, thank you so much. This was a very uh, information-packed uh, session with uh, lots to think about. Um, I am 100% sure that we're gonna have to go to the Zoom uh, breakout room. Uh, the, as presenters, uh, the panelists, you won't have to do anything. However, attendees, you're gonna see a link in your chat box. If you wanna join us and continue this conversation, please click the link and um, we'll take it from, you'll be able to join us. So we had some questions um, and the first question was about, are the models that are being shown by Dr. Evans, by uh, Nuno, by Giovanni, sorry, by, and Mark, are they predictive? And they all are predictive models, yes? Yes. Okay, so that one. Forecast models. So that one was quick. A question, an interesting question was, even though these storms have like very negative impacts, can there be some positive things that come out of the meaning like new services, like uh, hazard services? And any of you could take a crack at that. This was coming from Nigeria. Well, I'll take a, a crack just at the physical impact. Um, and Abaris has shown that for the Southeast US, hurricane landfalls are typically what breaks a major drought in the area. So if we didn't have hurricanes in the Southeast, then the water resources would be much more vulnerable. Hmm. Would you also see something like crisis management? I mean, this could be private services coming out of these kinds of extreme events. Well, I'll, you know, I'll take a stab at that. I, I guess from our perspective, uh, and I alluded to this in my talk, there, there has been an increase in awareness um, following major events. And I think you know, the, one of the few upsides to having so much storm activity in the last 20 years is that everyone is a lot more prepared uh, and uh, sort of generally weather savvy, for lack of a better term, um, has, a, has a better sense of what their, um, what, the, what their own needs are for preparedness plan. Um, that's, that's a sense I get. And it's kind of a, it's something we see in, in disaster management across the board. It takes a big event to raise those, um, to raise that awareness. 